You're listening to audio from Cities Church. You can find more resources and learn about our ministry by visiting cityschurch.com. So amen, Father. As Joshua has prayed, I just want to ask again that you would give grace to us. Give grace to us this morning with the Bible open before us. We ask that you would bless now the ministry of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I remember this one night, this is several years ago, um, when our oldest three children were still babies. Uh, it was close to dinner time, and one of, one of the babies was just, they were, they were absolutely losing their minds. Okay, some of you parents, you know what I'm talking about here. You've seen this before. It's called baby rage. It's a real thing. And, and this child, who is going to remain nameless, was, this is what, he was in his high chair, and he was screaming his lungs out. His face was completely red. And he was so mad that he like tried to rip off his shirt. But like the front part, he got over his head. But then he was kind of stuck like this. Have you, have you seen kids do that? Just, you know. And it just made things worse. He was hangry. That's what it was. And we could not get him his food fast enough. We couldn't, we couldn't, we, we couldn't get the food to him fast enough. But when I think back to this night, that's, that's not the part that I remember. Because if you're a parent, you've seen this before. Parents see this all the time. The reason that I remember this one particular night was not the tantrum, but it was because of what my wife, Melissa, said to this child in the middle of the tantrum. So he was upset, and he was loud, and he was convulsing, right, in anger. And she, she knelt down by his high chair, and she made eye contact with him. This was back when we still had patience. And she, <laughs> she was looking at him. This is what she said to him. This is what she said to him. Right in the middle of his tantrum, she looked at him, and she said, Buddy, have I ever not fed you? I just thought, that is the perfect question. It's the perfect, it puts, it put everything in perspective. How many times had my wife fed her children? You, you could do the math, right? Just take the number of days that they had been alive and multiply that by the number of times they eat each day. Even back then, this is like seven years ago, that was a high number. The number has only gotten higher. That's, that's, that's a high number. There have been a lot of hungry children in our home. We have seen a lot of hunger. But the question is just so perfect. The question is, have I ever not fed you? It's the perfect question, and it gets right at the heart of our passage today. You know where I'm going with this here in Exodus 16. In Exodus chapter 16, the people of Israel are hangry. Israel, at this point, you could call them an infant nation. They're just one month removed from being rescued in Egypt. And as a one-month-old nation, you could say this is a great time for a lesson. And there is a broad theme going on here in this passage. I want to go ahead and just tell you what it is up front. Um, we've seen this before. We're going to see this again. This is kind of like a key theme in the Old Testament, but it's really front and center here in Exodus 16. Here's the theme I want you to see. It's number one, the theme of human sinfulness. And number two, the theme of God's provision. So human sinfulness and God's provision. That's kind of the twofold theme we see here. On one hand, over here, we see how people are. They sin. And then on the other hand, over here, we see how God is. He gives. Human sinfulness God's precision. That, that, that's the main message overall. And what I want us to do for the sermon is just look at how Exodus 16 shows us three ways each of how this works out. Okay. And we're going to see three ways, three examples of human sinfulness. And then we're going to see three, three ways, three examples of God's provision. So you can say it this way. There's the bad news. And there's the good news. Human sinfulness here. God's provision here. And we're going to start over here. 
bad news first, okay? I want to show you three ways that we see human sinfulness in Exodus 16, okay? Over here. How do we see it? All right, let's get there. Look first at verse 2, all right? This is under the banner of human sinfulness. Verse 2, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the hand of Yahweh in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now, this is not the first time we've seen something like this from Israel. This is actually the third time, the fourth time we've seen this. There are three times before. Remember way back in chapter 5, when the people of Israel had to make bricks without straw, they blamed Moses for it, and they were very upset with him. Second time we see it is when, just recently, they're at the edge of the Red Sea. Pharaoh and his army are coming after Israel, and Israel is terrified. And so they blame Moses, and they say, basically, Moses, what have you done? And then the third time, which is right before this in chapter 15, this is after Israel has walked safely through the Red Sea. We're told they couldn't find any water for three days. And then finally, when they did find water, the water was too bitter to drink. And that's when we read in chapter 15, verse 24, and the people grumbled against Moses. And so what did Moses do? Well, Moses cried out to the Lord He cried out to Yahweh, and Yahweh turned the bitter water into sweet water. Yahweh worked a miracle. He made the undrinkable water into drinkable water. He worked a miracle to provide for his people. And that's when we read in verse 25 that this whole thing was a test. And so right before our passage here in chapter 16, I want, to sh- I want to just highlight this scene. This is the end of 15, right before 16. We see these three things. The people grumble, God responds, and it's called a test. The people had a need that was met by God's provision, and it was meant to be a statute for Israel. This is something that Israel is supposed to remember and follow. Hey, if we listen to Yahweh, everybody, hey, if we listen to him, if we listen to God, if we trust him, he's going to take care of us. And chapter 15 ends with the people of Israel encamped around 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. See, trust him. That's what, that's what this is saying. Trust him. He will provide for us. Just trust him. It's that simple, Israel. Just trust him. It's easy, right? Well, chapter 16 starts, and it's the exact same pattern over again. The people, again, grumble. They grumble again, just like they did in chapter 15. And again, God responds with provision, and once again, it's called a test in verse 4. Then Yahweh said to Moses, behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Again, people grumble. God responds. It's a test. Now, what kind of test is this? This is the second time we've seen this word test. What does it mean? Well, think about this test like an, ex- like an experiment, basically. The purpose in verse 4 is to find out whether Israel will walk in God's law or not. That's the same idea in chapter 15, verse 26. The question there is whether Israel will give ear to God's commandments. Now, what's fascinating about this is that up to this point in the Bible, there have been no laws or commandments. This is before Mount Sinai. This is before God gives the law. And so this test is a kind of testing Israel out. Are they going to handle commandments and such? Like, like, are they going to be able to follow Yahweh? Are they inclined to listen to him? That's the test. And here's the thing with the test. The results of this test are not really for God. Okay, because 
He knows how this is going to go down, right? He, God is not surprised by anything. The results of this test are also not for Israel. There, there is no evidence in this passage that Israel has any self-awareness. The results of the test are for us. This test, th- this testing of Israel is for the readers of this story. It's so that we may see Israel's sin. This is for us so that we would see the reality of human sinfulness right here. How then? How do we see it? Well, first we see it in the grumbling. So human sinfulness, number one, the people of Israel grumble against God. Y'all know what grumbling is? You guys know what It's one of those words in English that kind of sounds like what it means. Think about that. You going to try it? Say grumble out loud. Look at your neighbor. Say grumble. Grumble. See, you can't say it and, and smile. You, you can't say the word with a smile on your face. I tried. Over, you can't. The word kind of sounds like, like what it is. And, and it's actually, in English, this is, this is a great translation of the Hebrew verb because the original word means to complain about something in an accusatory sense. It means to decry a situation, but not just decry it. It's to decry it and blame somebody for it. That's what it means to grumble. Grumbling is not the same thing as groaning, and this needs to be said, okay? Because back in chapter 2, the whole reason that God even called Moses to begin with is because he heard the groaning of Israel. God heard their suffering. That's groaning. Grumbling is different. Grumbling is always depicted as a symptom of unbelief. Every time this word for grumbling is used in the Bible, it's negative. Every time. So see, we might groan because we're hurt, but we grumble because we're angry. We groan because we need God's help in our hardship. We grumble because we think God is harsh in our hardship. We groan because we know God can change things. We grumble because even if we know God can change things, we don't believe he will. Groaning is the sound of the faithful in suffering. Grumbling is the sound of the cynic spewing their pessimism. So how are you doing with that? How are we doing with that? In your situation, like whatever affliction you're dealing with, are you groaning or are you grumbling? The people of Israel grumbled. And and, and it wasn't just that they were hangry. It's because they did not trust Yahweh. Even after everything that Yahweh had done, he had rescued Israel from Egypt by great signs and wonders. He had defied nature by dividing the Red Sea in two. He provided water by a miracle when the people were hungry, but still they did not trust him. They grumbled. And Moses tells us, he's clear in verse 8, that their grumbling was not against him, not against Aaron. Aaron, their grumbling is against Yahweh. Within a month of walking through the Red Sea and seeing the bodies of their enemies scattered along the shoreline, Israel is already shaking their fist at God, which is never okay. Never okay. The grumbling shows their sinfulness. Their grumbling shows their sinfulness. Now, the second way we see the sinfulness here, this is number two. The people of Israel embellished their memory of Egypt. Notice verse three again. In their grumbling, they said, would that we had died by the hand of Yahweh in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. 
You see what they're doing here? They're making a valuation. They are comparing their current situation as a rescued people to their past situation as an enslaved people. And they are saying that the slavery was better. Because back then, when they were slaves, like just a couple months before this, back then, they sat by meat pots and ate bread to the full, which I think is completely bogus. We've already read what it was like in Egypt. At the end of chapter 2, again, remember, we're told that the people were so oppressed that they cried out to God for help. Their taskmasters were so vicious. They, they place impossible labor demands on the men. Their sons, the sons of Israel, were being ripped from the arms of mothers and thrown into the Nile River. The people of Israel were slaves subjected to genocide. The Egyptians were hunting to kill their children. But here in chapter 16, when they remember Egypt, they sat by meat pots and ate bread to the full. What? According to chapter 16 here, Israel used to live it up in Egypt. It's completely, this is completely delusional. They're delusional. But we can understand why they're thinking this way, right? They're, they're just really hungry. They're, they're thinking this way. This is what's going on here. They're thinking this way because their situation is difficult. This new life of freedom is so much harder than they thought it would be. And so they just want to go back. You ever want to go back? Like, because, you know, you've been set free in Christ. You're, you're set free. But life is still hard. Things are still hard. And maybe you think you were just better off before. Maybe you think things were better before Jesus rescued me. Do you ever want to go back? I'm just going to level with you here, okay? Nostalgia in the midst of hardship is a fool's errand. When you're following Jesus in the middle of difficulty... Your memory of the past before Jesus is unreliable. Things were not as good as you think they were. Those meat pots that you remember, it's a mirage. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. Israel is lying to themselves here. They're lying to themselves. It's another way that we see human sinfulness. Here's the third way. The people of Israel underestimated God's provision. This part comes through in how they responded to God's instructions about the manna. Okay, this is where we see the test. Can Israel walk in God's law or not? Well, this is what God said, okay? He's going to provide meat and bread, evening quail and morning manna. And, and this is how the, the people are supposed to gather it, okay? Six days of the week, they're supposed to gather just, um, just what they need for that day. They go out and they gather as much as they want to eat just for that day, but they must not save any of it for the next day. Then on the sixth day, they're supposed to gather twice as much on that day because the seventh day, the next day is Sabbath, and they're not supposed to do any work, any gathering on the Sabbath. It's very clear instructions that God gives you, very straightforward. Now, how does Israel do with that? Okay, this is the test. How do they do? Verse 19. Moses said to him, let no one leave any of it over till morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning and it bred worms and stank and Moses was angry with them. So, okay, that didn't go well. 
They didn't get that part. Okay. What about the seventh day? What about the Sabbath instructions? Verse 25, Moses said, eat it today for today is, is the Sabbath to Yahweh. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is Sabbath, there will be none. Verse 27, on the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. And Moses is angry here in verse 28. The people don't listen. The people cannot obey God. So even before we get the law, even before we really even know what the Sabbath is all about, the people cannot do it. The people cannot obey. Now, why? I want us to get under the disobedience here. Where is the disobedience coming from? Well, it's coming from a lack of faith. And specifically, it's coming from their lack of faith in God's provision. That's what's happening here. All right? God said he would give them, give them enough for each day. You can eat as much as you want for that day. But what did the people do? They tried to save a little extra for the next day, just in case on the next day God didn't do what he said. There's a fear element here. The people are guarding themselves against God being a liar. I know God said he'd give us what we need, but he might not come through. So let's shove some biscuits in our pockets. That's what they're doing here. And then on the seventh day, when, when God said there would be no manna, Some of the people went out and looked for manna anyway. Again, I think because of fear. This is FOMO, okay? Like, hey, I know God said this time there wouldn't be any bread, but you know, I saw the Joneses out early this morning, and uh, we might be missing something here. The bottom line is that they cannot trust God. They do not trust God. They have underestimated his provision. And really what they've done, they've dishonored him by their lack of faith. I mean, again, have they not seen what he can do? We're supposed to, we're supposed to ask this question. We read this passage. We're supposed to say, wait, have they not seen the power of Yahweh? Of course they have. But Israel's response just certifies the depths of human sinfulness. The depths of human sinfulness. So what does God do? What does he do? That's over here. God's provision. How do we see God's provision? Number one, we see God's provision in that he provides when there seems no way. And this is in the manna. We see this in the manna. Yahweh tells Moses in verse 8 that he's going to send manna. And then we actually see it happen in verse 13. Verse 13. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. Then verse 31 tells us that it was like coriander seed, white. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Imagine pie crust for a minute, okay? Because some of you are going to eat some pie this week. I am. And when you're eating the pie and you get to the crust, sometimes you, you save the crust for the end, sometimes you do it all in one. When you get to the crust, think about manna, okay? Imagine manna. It's not exactly, but think about it, okay? Imagine it as manna, and imagine that this stuff, this delicious pie crust, appears every single morning on the ground by sheer miracle. Every day you wake up, there's pie everywhere. Imagine that. Just think about that. That's what happened here, okay? Got to use your imagination, okay? Okay. That's what happened, except here, the people didn't know what it was. They didn't, they didn't have a category for it. They didn't know what to call it. And so when they called this, this pie crust on the ground, they, they saw it and they said, what is it? And, and that's what became the name for it. Manna in Hebrew literally means, what is it? It's like the candy bar, whatchamacallit. 
You guys know that candy bar? We know our candy bars in here. What should we call it? It's a Hershey bar. And uh, also, you may not remember this one. They all, Hershey also made a candy bar named Thingamajig. They discontinued it. It didn't work. But what should we call it? Thingamajig. The same name concept is used here for manna. What is it? Every morning they wake up, they go outside. What is it? Is on the ground. The name is meant to convey the miraculous nature of God's provision. That's, that's the point. The name makes sense when we realize that these people are in the desert, and you don't get bread in the desert. Nobody gets to bake bread in the desert because it's the desert. But this bread is from heaven. Every morning, the people of Israel wake up, and what is it? It's all over the ground just because God gives it. Bread on the ground for you is free for the taking. Every day, wake up. There's bread on the ground for you. Take as much as you want. Eat as much as you want because God gave it. That's manna. And and here's the lesson for us. It's that it doesn't really matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter how, dr- how dry the ground might be. It doesn't matter how impossible the situation feels. Yahweh provides when there seems no way. He provides when there seems no way. And the provision here has the exact same purpose as every miracle that Yahweh has done for Israel. Verse 7, it is so Israel will see the glory of Yahweh. Verse 12, when Israel eats this bread, then you shall know, then you shall know. If you haven't gotten the message yet, then you shall know when you eat the bread that I am Yahweh, your God, the God who makes something out of nothing, the God who calls into existence things that do not exist. Do you know that the God who feeds you is the God who created the universe with his words? That's what the man is about. And what he gives The bread he provides is always going to be enough. That's the second thing that we see here. And this is important when it comes to God's provision. Number two, over here in in God's provision, God provides enough for his people. Look at verse 17. This is after the manna appears, God commanded, verse 17, gather of it each one of you as much as he can eat, for you shall take an omer according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. That means this is not an every man for himself sort of thing, but this is a household thing. Get enough food for you and your whole household. Look at verse 18. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. So everybody here, this is what this is what Moses is saying. Everybody got exactly what they wanted. Nobody was left hungry, and nobody ate too much. Yahweh provided enough for his people with glorious precision. We've seen that. And it wasn't, this is important too, it wasn't measured by amounts and numbers. It was measured by the contentment of his people. Some of the people had small appetites and small families. Some of the people had large appetites. And it doesn't matter. It didn't matter. God provided when there was no way, and he provided enough. Everybody, all of God's people were fulfilled by what God gave. There's a message here for us about the grace of God. And we see that, I think, in the third example here of God's provision. This is the last point. We've seen human sinfulness. We've seen God's provision. This third way, God's provision of manna points us to the greater provision yet to come. 
All right, this is in verses 31 to 36. Basically, those, that, that last section there is kind of like an end note about the manna. Okay, God gives instructions to Moses about a way for Israel to remember the manna for generations to come. Already, manna has this like legacy component to it. Future generations of God's people are supposed to learn something from this manna, which means... This manna is not only about food for Israel in the desert. God did not just send the manna for a particular need in history. Instead, God sent the manna to Israel way back then to tell us something about himself today. All right? That's what's happening here. The manna was for us. We can already see this in the Old Testament, okay? Just four decades, four decades after Exodus 16, Moses is almost done in his leadership of the people. And this is what Moses says to Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Four decades after Exodus 16, Moses says, And you shall remember the whole way that Yahweh your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. So the bread is not really about the bread, see? The bread is about the self-giving grace of God. God gives his word, and that is what makes you live. And Jesus understood this. In the gospel of Matthew chapter four, when Jesus, just like Israel, was in the desert and tempted by Satan, listen to what Jesus says. This is Matthew chapter four, verse three. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But see, Jesus knew it's not about the bread. So then what does Jesus say to the devil? He quotes Moses. Jesus quotes Moses. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The bread is about the self-giving grace of God. It's about his word. And Jesus understands this because Jesus is the word. Jesus is the self-giving grace of God. Jesus is the true bread. And we know this because Jesus tells us this. In the Gospel of John, chapter 6, after Jesus, he's fed the 5,000, he's teaching a crowd of Jewish people, and they wanted to see him work another miracle. They wanted to see a miracle. This is what they said. They said, what sign do you do? that we may see and believe you. What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. See, they they wanted Jesus to, to give them more bread like Moses did. That's what they want. But then Jesus said to them, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven. But my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then in John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And then Jesus just keeps explaining. In John chapter 6, verse 47, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. 
This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The manna in the book of Exodus is about the self-giving grace of God. Exodus chapter 16 is about Jesus. Jesus says so. Jesus is God's way when there was no way. Jesus is the one who is always enough, always enough. Jesus is always enough. In fact, I think the Apostle Paul tells us this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And in 2 Corinthians 8, Paul quotes from Exodus 16. I just want to show you this, okay? For context, in 2 Corinthians, Paul has been raising financial support for the church in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, uh, the saints there were impoverished and burdened. And so Paul has been taking a collection for them from other churches, um, including now the church of Corinth. And so Paul, he wants the Corinthians to be generous like the Macedonians were. That's what he says. And Paul grounds all of this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, he grounds all of this in the grace of Jesus. This is what Paul says. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that you in his poverty might become rich. And then Paul draws out a fascinating application. It has to do with abundance and need. Paul doesn't want anyone to be burdened, but because Jerusalem had a need and Corinth had an abundance, Corinth can help supply for Jerusalem's need. The idea is that we we don't hoard our abundance, but that we help one another. We don't hoard the grace but we help one another. And to make this case, for Paul to make this case, he quotes Exodus 16, verse 35. He says, as it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Remember, that, that, that verb, that, that's about the manna. In Exodus 16, Moses is talking about manna, and manna we know, is is about how the self-giving grace of God is enough for his people. We know manna is about Jesus. And so what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians 8 is that Jesus is enough for his church. Paul takes the message of Exodus 16 He understands it's about Jesus, and this is his application. It's that there is enough of Jesus for all of his people, and at different times, we each get more of Jesus by receiving him from one another. This morning... There are some souls in this room that are starving. There are other souls in this room that are overflowing with joy. And every week at this moment, we come and we share this table together. Which means sometimes we come and we speak the question, Other times we come and we just need to hear the question. Has he ever not fed you? Church. Church. Has he ever not fed you? Come. Let us eat the bread that never perishes. This meal is for everyone who trusts in Jesus. If you believe, you may eat. For Jesus is the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. For indeed, his body is the true bread. Now it's our joy to serve you.